everyone, this is a hymn from the UMH, uh, Hymn 400. Come now, fount of every blessing. Good morning and welcome to our online worship this morning as we celebrate Pentecost. We are glad you are here. Hi everyone, this is a song from The Faith We Sing 2128, Come and Find the Quiet Center. Thank you. 
Do you know what your Myers-Briggs type indicator is? Do you know what Myers-Briggs is? Okay, so Myers-Briggs, it's an introspective self-report questionnaire indicating differing psychological preferences and how people perceive the world and make decisions. Essentially, it's 90 questions that determine whether you lean toward extroversion or introversion, sensing or intuitive, thinking or feeling or judging or perceiving. And when I did this questionnaire many years ago, I landed on INFJ. So if you ever hear people talk about, I'm an INFJ or an ENFP or something like that, they're talking about their Myers-Briggs personality type. So mine is introverted, you know, that's not much of a surprise for me. Intuitive, feeling, and judging. And INFJs are often called the advocate or the idealist. And this is what the internet says about INFJs. INFJ personalities are creative, gentle, caring. They are usually reserved but highly sensitive to how others feel. They are typically idealists with high moral standards and a strong focus on the future. They enjoy thinking about deep topics and contemplating the meaning of life. The INFJ type is said to be one of the rarest, with just 1-3% to of the population exhibiting this personality type. What sets them apart is their ability to take their idealism and translate it into action. They are not daydreamers or philosophers who just think about changing the world. They are capable of taking their values and using them to bring positive and lasting change. The rarest type in the Myers-Briggs test. I've always known that I was special. And one of the career paths that say are good that they say are good for INFJs is a religious leader. So I've truly lived into the story of what it means to be this personality type. So who do you know what your Enneagram number is? It's kind of a similar thing. So the Enneagram is basically the same thing, but different and way more questions. And I took one and I ended up with a four-way tie with these different nine numbers that describe me. So I picked number nine because it felt right when I read the description. So a number nine is, a, is the peacemaker. And this is what the Enneagram says about nines. Type nine exemplifies the desire for wholeness, peace, and harmony in our world. Nines are easygoing, emotionally stable people. They are open and unselfconsciously serene, trusting and patient with themselves and others. Their openness allows them to be at ease with life and with the natural world. As a result, others generally find it easy to be in their company. They are genuinely good-natured and refreshingly unpretentious. Because of their peaceful demeanor, nines have a talent for comforting and reassuring others and are able to exert a calming, 
healing influence in difficult or tense situations. They make steady, supportive friends who can listen uncritically to others' problems as well as share their good times. In work settings, they can be excellent mediators, able to harmonize groups and bring people together by really healing conflicts. And the cool thing about the Enneagram is that it also shows you how each type reacts when they're at their best or at their worst. You know, at their healthiest, nines recognize their value and connection to the world around them, much like the movie It's a Wonderful Life, where Jimmy Stewart realizes he makes a difference in the world, that he has an impact in a place. And at their worst, nines detach emotionally and retreat into isolation while blaming others for their stress. When I read about that, you know, it clicked in my head that I can be that way sometimes. And I thought of moments and memories where this story of the peacemaker was true for me. And I was also born at the end of October, which makes me a Scorpio. And if you're into horoscopes, this, this week it tells me, you know, Neptune is adding hints to both inspiration and illusion to my creative process and romantic involvements and to be aware of overextending financially. Now, I'm not really connecting to that story. You know, I feel like that one's a little too vague for me. But do any of these descriptions that I talked about sound like you? Do they sound like the exact opposite of you? What is your personality type? Which number are you on the Enneagram? It can be really fun to do a personality test like the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or read your horoscope. But these descriptions can often tell us a story about who we are. And then once we internalize that story, we can start telling it to ourselves. And sometimes we can enter a space where we believe that story so much that we are afraid to explore outside of it. We do this a lot. We love to find something that tells us a story about ourselves. We love to be put in a box. You know, like my dad says he's a Vikings fan, so he expects to be disappointed at least once a year. And my mom was a redhead, and so she can describe her personality as fiery. And I grew up telling myself the story that I hated vegetables, and now that I'm older, I'm realizing that some vegetables are really amazing, and that that story prevented me from enjoying some aspects of life. And we can do this a lot with the stories we find in Scripture, too. We can take one small aspect of it, we can internalize it, and we can tell that story over and over and over again. Sometimes it can be really good, and sometimes it can be really harmful. And this morning, we are exploring the story of Pentecost. And as we dive into it, I want to hold the question of what story am I telling myself as we read and explore the disciples' actions in this familiar passage. What story am I telling myself? Our reading this morning is Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven like the howling of a fierce wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native language. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look! Aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speak in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya, boarding Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they are full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people are not drunk as you suspect. 
After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For scripture in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to God. The disciples have been hearing stories about who they were their entire lives stories about their faith. You know, they carried the stories of Abraham. They carried the stories of Isaac and Jacob. They carried the stories of Moses, of King David, and of Isaiah. They carried the stories of the wilderness wanderings, of enslavement, and of exile. They were all part of this large story that God was speaking through God's relationship with people. The disciples were also being told stories from their peers and people from their society. They were told stories that they were uneducated, simple fishermen. They were told stories that they needed a Messiah to come and restore Israel, to expel the occupying Romans, and to lead Israel as an earthly king. They were told the story of what to expect from the Messiah. So what business does a simple uneducated, seemingly drunk fishermen have to stand up in front of a group of people at nine in the morning and connect the generation's old story of Israel with the story of a man who was executed by the religious elite with the story of what God is doing among them in the present moment. What business does Peter have being a simple, uneducated, seemingly drunk fishermen to stand up in front of a group of people from all over the world at nine in the morning and connect their story of Israel with the story of Jesus, with the story of what God is doing in that present moment. The audacity, the absurdity, the arrogance. But you see, Jesus told Peter a different story than the one that he knew growing up. And if you remember our scripture from last week, Jesus told his disciples where this story was heading. You know, in Acts 1, Jesus said to them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then the disciples asked, Is that when you will restore Israel? The disciples are still stuck in that old story. And Jesus responds to them, Y'all do not need to know the time or place, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus gave his disciples a new story. He gave them a vision of leaving Israel behind and being a witness beyond the borders of their previous story. And what does a witness do? They see something and then they say something. That's it. They see something and then they say something. And so when Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, he saw the connections from the story he was told growing up and the story Jesus was calling him toward. And Peter connects the presence of the Holy Spirit with Jesus' ministry, with God's covenant with David, and with the divine lordship of Jesus as the Christ. So it is not surprising to me that the whole world, the whole world known as to an uneducated, simple fisherman was present to hear this proclamation. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontus, Asia, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Libyans, Cyrenes, Cretans, and Arabs were present to hear Peter's message 
telling them that the stories they heard growing up were connected to the story of Jesus the Christ, and then once again connected to the story Jesus wants to tell them and send them and call them into the world with a witness. Peter, along with the 3,000 people he baptized that day with the other disciples there, broke out of their old story. They were no longer concerned about restoring Israel. They were concerned about being a witness for Jesus Christ. And that call to be a witness, to see and to speak about the love of Jesus, is what connects that story from Pentecost to our story, to God's story. The stories we read about in the Old and New Testament are chapters in the book of God's story with humanity. In paragraph 105, section 4 of the Book of Discipline, that's right, the Book of Discipline, our theological task states, Theology is our effort to reflect upon God's gracious action in our lives. In response to the love of Christ, we desire to be drawn into a deeper relationship with faith's pioneer and perfecter. Our theological explorations seek to give expression to the mysterious reality of God's presence, peace, and power in the world. By doing so, we attempt to articulate more clearly our understanding of the divine human encounter and are thereby more fully prepared to participate in God's work in the world. Our theological task includes the testing, renewal, elaboration, and application of our doctrinal perspective in carrying out our calling to spread scriptural holiness over these lands. Our theological task includes the testing, the renewal, the elaboration, and application of our perspective in carrying out our calling to spread scriptural holiness over these lands. For the Book of Discipline in, among, and beyond us, thanks be to Wesley. My point in reading that is that our story as United Methodists, is connected to the story Peter is telling in Pentecost, which is connected to the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, which is connected to King David, to Moses, to Jacob, to Isaac, to Abraham, to you, to me, to us. We are called into the same story of being a witness, to see God's love, to see God's grace, to see God's movement in the world, and to tell others about it. We are called to reach the next person for Jesus, and not in a way that tells a story that harms folks, but because we understand that when we love God, when we love Jesus, when we listen to the Holy Spirit, our lives get better. We experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We experience what it means to be a part of God's story. And we believe that when people love Jesus, their lives get better, and we are called to be a witness to that story of love. So what is stopping us? Remember the question I wanted to hold as we explored Pentecost today? This, what story am I telling myself? What story am I telling myself? So what story is coming up in you right now as you hear these words? If I was sitting in your pew or in your chair, I know I would be thinking, that's all fine and good, and I wholeheartedly agree and relate to what you're saying, but I am an introvert. I don't like to talk to people about anything. How could I possibly talk to them about something as intimate as their relationship with God? Sometimes we can get trapped in a story that we were told, and end up telling it again to ourselves over and over and over. And when I discovered I was an introvert, I began to use it as an excuse to be closed off from others to avoid people. So you can imagine my discomfort when God called Francine and I to go and knock on the doors of our direct neighbors around our church, holding a clipboard asking them questions about what they think about churches. You can imagine the kind of awkward door opening of someone thinking, you know, what are you trying to sell me right now? You can imagine the awkward shuffling of papers on my clipboard 
as I try to move them around and write on them as they speak and as the wind blows them into their yard and I have to go run and pick them up before they get away. As far as I'm concerned, knocking on a stranger's door is the ends of the earth. But then as I talk to people, I learn things. I connected with people in the community that I would never have connected with if I hadn't knocked on their door. And some of the families that I talked to would not have showed up to our movie night last fall. They may, they may, they may have enjoyed sleeping in on Sundays without hearing our church bell at 10 in the morning every Sunday, thinking that we had closed our doors for good. But instead, I reached out and I spoke. God is calling you to be a witness, to look at the ways that God is moving in your story, the ways that God is moving in my story and in our story. And God is calling us to tell others about it. So back to our question, what story am I telling myself? I'm too old, I'm too young, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, I'm just not smart enough, I will never accomplish anything, so I should just give up. I just can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do anything. Sometimes the stories we tell ourselves may be true, and we do have to recognize our limits. But sometimes we get trapped in those stories and we forget that we are also part of the story that God is telling us which is that you are a part of a larger story. You are part of something bigger. God says, I am pouring out my Holy Spirit on all people. Join us. Amen. Hi, everyone. This is a hymn from the UMH. Savior again to thy dear name. Savior, 
Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. God send you, the Spirit fill you, Christ go with you, and you with Christ always and everywhere. Go in peace. Amen.